Hello. Hey, how's it going? Uh, I don't know many of the faces here. I know some of the faces here tonight, uh, which, which uh, uh, shows the fact that I haven't been at a node meetup in quite a long time. Uh, but so basically, May 2012, uh, I started the first node meetup uh, in Dublin. Back in, it was back in Engine Yard uh, when Engine Yard was actually a company uh, on Barrow Street, and uh, uh, the first meetup that we ever did, we had like. About a hundred people there. Uh, we drank all the beer. Nothing left. Someone nearly killed himself on the skateboard. Um, and uh, the first night that we were there, we we, uh, we, we my, my, myself and uh, my my business partner had started a a Node.js kind of consulting company thing, and we, we didn't really know very much about business. And, um, and uh, of course, we we thought we were going to be you know rich. We were rich this time for once Rodney like had a job and, and then nobody knew what we were talking about. We were like going into like uh, uh, agencies in Dublin uh, pitching techie stuff and, and literally like sometimes one, one time we were so crammed that, that the two people at the, at the meeting with us actually just walked out and left us at the meeting or whatever like it. And then so we, we started the, the node meetup around the same time and uh, the first night that we did a meetup uh, I, I asked for a show of hands, like how many people are using Node.js in this room? And it was like, it was kind of one and a half hands out of a hundred people, like. Um, but uh, tonight I'd say there's probably, uh, I'd say at least 60% of people here. Wait, like who's using Node.js now? Yes, it's like 90%. You two guys, no. At the end of the night, you're gonna be using it, like. Um, but uh, but but back in 2012 we were we were kind of bootstrapped and by the seat of our pants kind of trying to keep the money coming in every month so we could pay our staff and if, if we had enough left then we pay ourselves uh, and, and uh, you know uh, thankfully like uh, you know the, the the kind of technology has taken off and the community's taken off and, and uh, we're we're in a really fortunate position now that that we have a you know pretty successful company and. Um, and uh, so, so tonight is like it's kind of a coming of age for uh, Nearform as a company in that we've always camped in somebody else's office uh, and people have always kind of like you know oh yeah we let the known guys in there get mad and, and whatever like uh, but, but tonight like we, we, we just took out a, a, a kind of a, a rent on this office with uh, John and Greg uh, down the back there uh, you know for a couple of years and uh, we have our own office in Dublin now, which is capable of actually hosting the, uh, the Dublin Node Meetup. So, uh, you know, you're all very, very welcome here tonight. And, you know, five years after the, the night when there was one and a half hands, and, and we're the crazy guys now, we're the guys who are the visionaries, and everyone's using Node.js, and it's all great or whatever. Um, but, uh, so, so tonight, um, we, we've kind of uh, been on a bit of a journey um, uh, looking at, like, you know, uh, I guess the how do you support open source, and how do how do enterprise how does enterprise support open source? Or, um, and, and I think that the the kind of playbook that that that's been around for you know, the last fifteen or twenty years is now completely out of date, right? Um, and, and so what you what you end up seeing is uh, with, with Node.js, it's like a it's a community open source project. It's not a it's not a commercial enterprise open source project. It's actually paid by geeks. Uh, from their houses and their bedrooms and, and all that kind of stuff. Like people started working on this project because they wanted to express something or, or, or communicate something to the world. Um, and um, and so uh, the question always comes around whether it's a mainstream technology, uh, the, f the first mainstream programming language, not uh, to come from either academia or you know Microsoft or or Sun or you know the big enterprise. Um, so, so how do you actually support the, you know, the underlying platform? How do you support the community that, that build all the pieces of technology? Uh, you know, even though like the, you know most of the people involved in it don't even have a way of taking money. If you want, if you were, you know, they wanted to give them money, they wouldn't even know how to accept it. Um, so, for for kind of the last couple of years, as we started to kind of become a bit bigger as a company, uh, we've always tried to to sponsor somebody or. Or put something back into into the, the kind of community, um, 
but when we do that uh, with a view to uh, a we don't want to own somebody else's project uh, what we want to do is we want to kind of try and add something back uh, to the community that we have to we derive so much value from um, so it's kind of an open question like uh, you know long term uh, how does community open source thrive uh, and how do we look upon this this kind of movement uh, which is which is not driven by enterprise and try and foster it and, and, and see what interesting things can happen um, so uh, I guess it's kind of an open an open thing to think about uh, I, I think everyone here there's something interesting happening uh, on the internet at the moment called Node.js and uh, it's this, this, this globally instantly uh, distributed uh, kind of new form of, of communication uh, via software modules um, and, and how do we how, how can we be mindful of the fact that it is something new and something a little bit different than what's gone before uh, and how can we have to, to try and help it along or support it or whatever um, so anyway you're you're all really really welcome uh, tonight uh, Josh has come all the way from Berlin uh, we, we, uh, we've, we've managed to, uh, we've, we've met Josh, God, we know each other like a year or two now. Yeah. Yeah, from the internet, like, you know. <laughs> uh, but Josh has been working with uh, some folks that I know quite well, like uh, Max Ogden and, and a bunch of like, you know, mad scientists on the internet. And we started working on this uh, this framework too, uh, this front-end framework. And, um, uh, we started working with Yosh a little bit, and then uh, David Bersford, who's not here tonight, uh, kind of came to me a few months ago and said, you know, it'd be great if we could sponsor you for a while. Uh, and I was like, okay. And he was like, all right. And I was like, yeah, grand, let's do it. Um, so anyway, to, you know, we've kind of sent out a bit of a press release or a blog today saying that we're, we're going to sponsor you. We've got Yosh working on it full time for a while. Uh, but, but like, it's important to note that we don't want to have our name on it. We don't want to own their license. We don't want to do any of that stuff. We just want to kind of help to foster things that are interesting that are happening out there. Uh, and if there's somebody doing something interesting, it, it's, a, it's, a nice, it's a nice thing to be able to do in your life if you see someone doing something interesting that you can help to, to kind of push it along a little bit and see where it goes or whatever. So, um, so Yosh is, is over to do a, a talk about you tonight. And uh, yeah, it's, it's nice to be able to uh, to help the 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 artists uh, to paint pictures, um, so yeah, that's it. I'm gonna start. Um, today is my presentation about Chu, which is basically what a frontend framework would look like if you took a Node.js person to write one, because that that's how I identify. That that's why I'm at this meetup and not like at the other meetup. Not kidding, but um, it, it's true though. Um, so, hi, Josh. Uh, you might know me like this on Twitter, if, if you do Twitter at all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, what, what, what's this true thing? So, it's a choose, choose a front end framework. That means it, it's a framework to build your front end applications with. Uh, it's a framework, yeah, that we covered that. Um, it, it also includes a compiler, which I'll show off in a little bit. Because we, we have opinions about like toolchain. Because if you're these days you, you can't really just have a front end framework, it always comes like with a little build step and usually a build step is kinda of complicated. So we, we include a build step that makes this whole thing a bit less complicated. And it, it comes also with a code generator. So setting up your project becomes like one command. Yeah, that that's that's true. So um, <laughs> yeah, you need you need easy. It needs to be easy these days. I like easy. easy. Easy is great. Um, so, true architecture, there's three steps to this. First off, we have a mutable state, which means we have a single object, we call it state, you can mutate it, and that's it. Um, we have event emitters. So, uh, all communication between like your logic and your views and all that stuff is done using a uh, Node.js event emitter. It's, it's very similar, it looks the same. So, you like have dot on and dot emit. And, and you can emit events and some data, right? And the, and the last bit is we have the DOM API, um, which which is uh, the other the other big part of it, where where you know uh, oftentimes you, you try a framework and they, they come up with a lot of new abstractions, 
What we've tried to do is keep as many of the actual DOM APIs in place as possible. So where possible, we use the, the same names for APIs as, as the DOM would have uh, to do the same things. So as you're learning Chew, you will learn more about the DOM, which means you will learn more about the web platform, which, you know, um, at the end of the ride, you might be like, oh, I really don't like Chew, but you'll come out of it like, oh, sweet, and I, I know these APIs now, or at least what they do and what, what they represent. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's our architecture. Uh, so what does a true app look work like? Work like. I'll show you what it looks like in there. So we got a human over over here. Wait, like I should do this. Look, <laughs> you're really really happy with it. So you got you got a you got a person. That person interacts with the dom. Uh, what? Oh, never mind. Uh, then the dom. Uh, you attach like listeners onto the dom, like on click. And then you, you handle that event in something we call stores, um, which handles logic, which in turn, you know, like something happened, an event changed, someone clicked on a link or something, and then it, it does stuff and it flows through a router, uh, which means like either a route changed or not, just always goes through there, which triggers like the correct view for that page, which, which is our templating logic and stuff, and which in turn creates more DOM. So that, that's the little cycle. The humans interact with the DOM and it just flows like that. If you're coming from like React land, it's pretty similar in, in thought. Um, so yeah, that, that's our architecture. Um, <laughs> so the, the, the way you create an app uh, kind of looks like this. You require true. You create a new instance of app, uh, which is just like you call the function. Then you pass, like uh, requiring stores looks like this. You just pass in the app.use. Uh, requiring views looks like that. You pass into up the route. You give it like the name of the route. You can use like partials and stuff, and you know all the, all the good stuff. And then you uh, mount it onto the DOM, saying, "Oh, here, mount it onto the body, or whatever other query selector you like." And then um, this is the way you use like third-party plugins, or you know, uh, in this case, our dev tools. You just pass it into app that use like you would anything else, and that that's the basics of it. Now, building a store looks like this. So like I said, uh, one of the basics is, uh, oh, I should have been recording this. Hold on. Yay, record. Great. <laughs> Here's one third of a talk, like recorded to whatever. Um, sweet. Um, anyway, uh, back, yay. OK, great. So you, you get like the mutable state and the event emitter into every instance of app.use. Uh, so here we say, we're, we're going to create a little app that has like a little counter on it or something, right? And when you click it, you increment the counter and then like re-renders and that, that's great. So the, the counter starts at zero, so you like mutate the state. You say state.count is zero. Cool, great. Uh, and then you meter the on increment. We give the callback with the exact count as to which we should increment it. And then we say, well, we, we add the count to state.count. And then once we're done, we say re-render this thing. Now, the, this, this is the particular part where we're like quite different from all the other frameworks, because we have explicit re-renders. There's no such thing as like, oh, you changed a bit of state with like a function, and now you must re-render, because there's no other way of changing that state. No, 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 we make it explicit. So you could like batch all your updates into one thing and re-renders, or you could decide never to re-render, or you, there, there's, there's all these things. You're really in control with it, uh, which, which makes it stuff usually a bit less magic-y, I mean, more to the bones. Uh, which, which I particularly like because that's the way Node works also. Um, so yeah, rendering uh, looks, so where in the other one we have like state.emitter, here we have state.emit because you can't attach listeners. You create something uh, called a, a ESX template string, so you require HTML from true HTML. You get this function which you put to the app.route, and then you, you return this template string. And you, you write like actual HTML on it. It's like completely everything that's valid HTML is valid in here, which which means no custom languages, no custom parsers, no like uh, build steps needed. We we have one for convenience. Well, actually, require, but uh, we we have one for convenience, but it's it's not necessary, which is a big difference. So we create a pull button. We say count is zero, and uh, here we just make it dynamic. So we say, oh, whenever you like render this thing, uh, take the value of state dot count. And whenever you click on this button, say, uh, trigger the onClick function. So onClick here gets the event, and we say increment by one. So the way this looks is like this. 
I, I could show you a demo, but you know, I was like, demos always fail, so I'll just like <laughs> sort of record one with a big button and change the text slightly. But um, yeah, that, that's basically all this code does. You click a button, it emits an event, it triggers a re-render, it increments the value of state by one, and then it triggers a re-render. Sorry, one re-render, not two. Uh, but yeah, so that, that's the very basics, but we, we have like more in this stuff. Uh, what else? We have like uh, the DOM content loaded event to detect whether or not the DOM is loaded. So this only works in browsers because the uh, node doesn't have like the DOM content loaded. So this is a really good way to like make code just work in browsers. We have navigate event. Uh, this is not like actually in the browser, but we added it. That's that's probably the only thing in the whole like true thing that's like not part of the browser. Um, so we say, hey, whenever you navigate to a thing, navigate to that thing. Here we say um, this is like closer to DOM event. Immediately emit push state, go to foo bar. Immediately emit pop state, uh, which means go one back. So this one says navigate forward to foo bar which would then trigger console log navigated to foo bar. And then you say pop state, and then it says navigated back to prior route, probably slash or something, right? So th this is the way you do routing. Uh, it triggers like render by default. Um, yeah, service like rendering, this is all there is to it. You just said two string and then like works. So you get your app and you two string it. And then as a second argument, you could pass it like some state or you could like get all fancy and do like XHR requests and wait for them with event emitters if you wanted to. But the, the, the basics is app dot to string and then it's server renders and all server render and like probably I think we're the fastest one that server renders at the moment. I'm not sure. Um, but it's, it's literally just concatenating strings the whole way. Um, so that's cool. Uh, <laughs> so that, that's the that's the very basics. Now now you basically could like write any sort of app you would want to, uh, like the basics, right? Like a little bit of templating logic, a little bit of like uh, state management stuff. You can like test it just because it's all like valid node code. Uh, so to make it easy, we've got this thing called Create Chew App. Um, this, this this was a fun animation because it was like, look, it's A, and then you go to B. Yeah, I, I didn't know how to do animations, so that's my like. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I do like this slide though. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, so you say create chew app, which is uh, it's a kind of small font, I guess, but create chew app and it, like creates a new chew app. Uh, if you do npx, by the way, it's this fun little npm command uh, where it's the equivalent of npm install dash g and then executing the command, but always takes the latest. So you can just be like, hmm, I want to run this with like one generator, one off, and then, you know, npx does that for you. If you like have a recent node version, it does that, uh, which is sweet. So you say npx create you at whatever project name you got, and it will like generate it, and the output's like this. Like, yay, create like a little project for you. Sweet. Uh, the other thing, bunk Uh the, yeah, it's, uh, if anyone knows what this is, you watch way too much anime. But um, <laughs> um, the uh, easiest way to compile JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, or better known as, we take care of your build chain. Because I've, I've seen like plenty of projects where people are like, oh my god, we like we got this build chain, and like one person like a year ago wrote this thing, and now they've left or they've moved on to another project within the company. It's really hard to maintain and. Ooh, we really need this other feature, and no one really dares to touch this thing because there's five stages to it, and oh my god. And so basically what we do is we, we have a build chain for you, and you can just like keep updating it and it'll like work for you. Because um, build chains shouldn't be hard, uh, even though there's a lot of stuff to think about, you know? So the, the, the way this works is we got a thing called Bankai. It's got a start command, so one back. Oh, I can't redo really that. But you say Bankai start, and I pass it index.js or something, and then it, it compiles your project, and it gives you like a little overview of what, what's going on, right? So it, it takes care of like your assets, copies them over, serves them up, documents, ser uh, creates them from like your server-side rendering stuff. It includes like preloading, uh, <laughs> content integrity checks, which is like uh, SHA-512 sums in the script tags. What else does it do? It includes like your whole like uh, CSS build, generates service workers for you with like, um, so I'm just gonna go off here, just so you like get overwhelmed with words and I'm like, okay, shit, I didn't think about that. Um, <laughs> I've been working on this for the last two months, so 
uh, what else does it do? It includes all the files for you, it, it prefixes all the, comp all the assets for you with like unique paths, so uh, when you, uh, you can do cache busting and lots of stuff. There's so much stuff in here. We have it in the readme, the whole list. But basically, it's, it's that one command does it for you. And that, that's, that's what we want it to be. We want, we want things to be like one command, very simple. Uh, same with build. You can like compile it to static files. Uh, we even like output broccoli compiled versions for you. So if you have Buddha and Nginx, will just detect it and serve it up. But the compressed, the ultra compressed version, uh, or deflate or gzip based on fallback and like uh, accept headers. Um, okay, next thing, queue devtools. Uh, because debugging your app should be really straightforward. Like if something goes wrong, you want to like be able to figure it out with like a set guide of tools. Um, so we just created a bit of content. And then you can say true dot state. Oh, I should have done true dot help somewhere. I think I forgot. There's a true dot help command in here. But true dot state debugs your latest state. It just says like, here's your latest state. This is what it looks like right now. Uh, true dot storage explains what's going on in storage in your browser right now. Most people uh, don't tend to know that there's a, a thing called persistent storage and non-persistent storage. Uh, you might want to enable persistent storage if you care about offline apps. Uh, true.log shows the latest events in chronological order. Uh, true.debug shows stack traces for every single mutation in your mutable store. So you can be like, oh, where did that mutation happen? And you just like, click the link, and it, it shows off, oh, cool, on line 2899, uh, we assigned route to self state route, which is pretty useful if you're like, ooh, something changed, I don't know where, I don't know why. Um, yeah, that's, that's DevTools. There's more stuff in there. You can emit events, there's two events, all, all sorts of stuff. Uh, what else? Oh, we got Chew WebSocket. We got Chew Speech to Text. Yes, also text to speech, but eh, these are user run packages. Uh, oh, here's the other one. Sorry, beard. Um, <laughs> so we got another component, which is going to be, we're still working on this. Our component abstraction already works really well, but we, we're not quite satisfied with the ergonomics of it. But the, this thing you'll be able to like, you can already like plug into like every other framework because it's like, um, we use the DOM. So every every single component, every single template you create is real DOM nodes. And the DOM, and the diffing you do is not like virtual DOM nodes, it's it's real DOM node diffing. So if, if you if you create a DOM node and you put it like into something else, then it'll just work because all the all the other frameworks out there, they know how to take these DOM nodes and like and like wrap them. That's how you get like these fancy code editors and maps and all this stuff. They can wrap these things. So now the, now the component, because it, it, it takes the true template, so it actually takes any sort of like DOM node stuff. Um, we have now component adapters for it, which which you can then like take your component, wrap it up in now component adapters, and suddenly serve to all the frameworks. Um, so that, that's our thing. We're still tweaking it, so that's why it's not part of true core yet. Uh, we've got service works going on, and we got, uh, in Okigoma, which is a little, uh, what do you call it, CMS? Like, plain text CMS? It's, it's work in progress, so I'm just mentioning it. I'm not like showing it off yet, but it's, it's really cool. It's made by people in LA. Um, so just to show you off what it looks like to use a third-party thing, you say, uh, require true WebSocket, you pass it a path, like, oh, now trigger like slash WS, this on that. Now you create your own little custom function. You say, uh, on a message, uh, print this message with the data. And that, that's all there is to WebSockets in the browser with true. And then that's pretty much true for like all the other stuff. So like text-to-speech, speech-to-text, you can be like, whoa, whenever I hear like text, like do this thing. Or hey, whenever I emit like say this thing, it just says the thing. And then there's there's lots of abstractions you can do with this, like server send events, uh, keyboard input, gamepad, uh, I don't know, all sorts of stuff, everything, I don't know. Um, that's that's it. That, that's true. I hope you like get a good idea of what true is. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, again, th thank you to Nearform because they're like sponsoring this project till like May, for sure, um, which, which is pretty amazing because you know I get to do this stuff full time, which means when people like you use it. And come back with like, oh, this doesn't work. We just like get to fix it instantly, right? And like, I hope at like 10 p.m. on the Tuesday I'll have like some time before I like I'm too tired. I don't know. So it's it's pretty amazing. Um, and and thank thank you for listening. Um. I, 
I, I think. Do, do we do questions? Yeah. Anyone has any questions? Any? Uh, any? Any? Does anyone have any questions? Or you can ask me questions over a beer. That's also fine. What was the main problem you're trying to fix? Just like you compared to say anger, react. Like, so what was the one thing that you wanted to try to change about it? Uh, so the, the question was, what what was the main thing I wanted to fix with this? Um, actually, there, there were there were like a, quite quite a few things. Like um, let, let's take React for example. It it doesn't use JavaScript as a language. It it uses this thing called JSX, which isn't like actual JavaScript. Um, which, which annoyed me a little bit. I was like, why are you requiring us to write a different language? That, that's not cool. And then second of all, it was like really heavy and you know, it's, it's 50 kilobytes to like include all the tiniest version you can get. Whereas this is like sitting at 3.6. You know, that, that's order of magnitude smaller, which is significant. And that, that's even without like hooking up the routing and state management and all the other stuff. Which, which means like to get your base application going, there, there's a lot of stuff you kind of like need to wire together and then like your build system you also need to wire together and before you're like done there, there's like a meme like there, there's a thousand uh, boilerplates out there and I was like why are there boilerplates? T to me it felt like it was just not good design like there was a design challenge they, they didn't solve so that, that's where we approached this from from like hey what if we could just like have an answer to front end like here's here's your framework in which you build this stuff. It's flexible enough to like allow you to build everything, from games to like you know uh, business analytics software, because it's it's that solid. It's like such a good abstraction, and and um, I feel like we're we're approaching it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, anyone else? No? Okay, well, uh, thank you. <laughs>